The name of the talk is Identity Loyalty, Connecting the Brand. And so the first part of this lecture, first part of this talk is really going to be an introduction and the examples that I want to show you that have to do with the power of brand. So I want to put up some images and I want this group to just tell me whatever comes to mind when you see these images. Just shout it out. Whatever just pops in your mind immediately. Okay? So for example, let's start with this one. Search. What else? Cool. Innovation. What else? Data. Lots and lots and lots of data. What else? Maps. Maps. Yep. What else? Competitor. Competitor. Interesting. What else comes to mind? Money. money. Lots of money. <laughs> we have a financier, ladies and gentlemen, in the audience. <laughs> yes, this is a great place to study finance. A huge part of your life, right? Huge part of your life. This is a term now. Go Google it, right? I mean, it's part of the, listen to me, it's part of the vernacular, right? What about this one? I heard boring. What else? <laughs> expensive, right? The word expensive is very interesting, right? People pay a lot of money for this, right? It's addictive. What else? Interesting. Very, very interesting. What about this one? Oh. I heard old and I heard old school. Detroit. What else? American. Americana, right? Interesting. What about this one? Happiness. Happiness. <laughs> Happiness. Sugar. Coca-Cola, guys. Coca-Cola is an example. By the way, I'm from Atlanta. Okay, so by definition, I come from Coke country. Okay, so I'm going to show you guys some examples of the power of the Coca-Cola brand when we talk a little bit more about some of the ideas I want to share with you for today's session. What about this one? Swoosh, right? What else? Just go for it, just do it. What? What else? LeBron, right? LeBron, who just put my boy D. Roy's out of the playoffs. What else? Jeter, what else? Jordan. Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan, what else? Tiger Woods, careful. Right? What about this one? Mickey Mouse, what else? Kids, what sort of values, what sort of, what sort of characteristics come to mind when you see this? Magical, wholesome, what else? Entertaining, delight. How about honesty? Values that are associated with all of the concepts that have to do with wholesomeness, familyness. What else? Childhood. I'm going to show you some examples from my own personal life and my interactions with Disney that are really, really testament to the power of that brand. What about this one? It's like super expensive. Uh-oh. We have some Apple haters in the audience. And uh, what else comes to mind? Amazing design, innovative, cool, jobs, creativity. Change the world. Change the world. What else? Convenience. Phenomenal brand. I'm going to talk about Apple uh, in this context. How about this one? This one's kind of interesting. Let's get your reactions to this one. <laughs> what comes to mind? Old school. Old school. Old school. What else? Can't make decisions. Can't make decisions. <laughs> what else? What else? MSNBC. MSNBC. <laughs> what else? Money. 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 What else? Here's why I'm showing you guys this. Political parties are brands. Political parties are brands too. Okay? Political parties are brands too. In fact, if you ask the Republicans, <laughs> They are right in the middle of a challenge for their brand because they are trying to now speak to a completely different customer, right? So now they have to rebrand, like, how do we talk to this other group of folks that we may not have been so successful in talking to talking previously, about, talking right? To. Talking about talking to, okay. <laughs> easy now, easy. There may be some Republicans in the audience, so. So this is interesting, right? I want you guys to, here's the point. The point is, the point is very simple point about brands. Brands are assets, okay? And if you think about what makes these brands so iconic, it's the fact that these thoughts that pop into your mind when you see these images, this is not by accident, right? It's free association, but at the same time, it is the extent to which these brands have tried to communicate something to you about what they are. Right? And those things are in your mind with respect to how you perceive the brand. 
And the power of the brand then is that it can become part of your psychological uh, experience that goes above and beyond the mere features or mere attributes of the product. And I'm going to show you some examples of this. So when we think about branding, what we say is there's basically three levels of branding, right? Branding is just creating some kind of consistency, right? Creating a rich, meaningful system uh, of clear ideas and associations that define what the brand stands for, okay? However, good branding does that and differentiates from competitors and connects consumers, right? Connects to the brand through this thing called loyalty. Now, let me ask a question to the class. What is the definition of loyalty? What is the definition of loyalty? How do you measure loyalty? How far are you willing to go to stick with somebody? How? So I heard, interesting, I heard the word repeat purchases. Is repeat, are repeat purchases loyalty? Not necessarily, right? Repeat purchases are indicative of something happening over and over again. But it's not necessarily the case that because you buy brand X over and over again that you're loyal in one significant, meaningful way. Not necessarily. It might be the case. It might be the case, but not necessarily. So what I'm going to talk about today is a different kind of loyalty that I want to impress upon you that's important. And that's what I refer to as this notion of great branding. And that is great branding will connect the consumer to the brand in a way such that the consumer will internalize the brand as an aspect of who they are. Listen to me very, I'm gonna start preaching in a minute. Listen to me very carefully. <laughs> Consu listen to this, consumers internalize the brand as an expression of who they are or who they want to be. That's something different. That's different. I call that identity loyalty, right? It's not just you buy again and again and again. It's like this brand it's part of who I, it's a symbol that represents my lifestyle. It represents me. It represents who I am. And my argument, in, my entire argument today is if you're building a company, building a brand, building a service, running a business, trying to create value, this is a hugely powerful concept to try to tap into. And I want to show you some examples of this in just a second. So I want to start this by kind of motivating this idea about thinking about why you should be changing your viewpoint and not thinking about your brand, your company, your business, or you, because you are a brand too, right? People are brands. But how you should shift your thinking toward this notion of identity loyalty, creating a connection. So I want to talk to you about the case for why you should re-examine your firm's brand building strategy. And I want to start with a simple thought exercise. So here's the, here's the situation. So you are at home with your, let's say, your four-month-old child, and he or she is really screaming, making a lot of noises, obviously very upset, very distressed, and obviously a little bit sick. So you, as the parent, decide, okay, I gotta run to the, the grocery store, run to the CVS to get something so I can appease my child, so I can make my child feel better, okay? So you run down to the CVS, you go to the aisle where these remedies are, and you see this, okay? All right, so there you are in front of the aisle. You're thinking to yourself, okay, let's see. I've got this CVS, this store brand, uh, infant pain reliever. It's $6.49. I've got this infant's Tylenol. It's a dollar more. Hmm. Let's see. Uh, they look pretty similar. Oh, by the way, by law, they are required to be identical in terms of their active ingredients. So my point that I'm showing to you this is, Think, guys, think about this. Think about this. This, dri this sort of thing drives economists crazy, right? And the reason it does is like, why in the world, how is it possible that you can have two products that are identical, identical, right? Identical. They are exactly the same thing, and yet one costs more. Who in the world would be rational and pay more for exactly the same thing, right? This drives economists crazy, right? Raise of hands. Let me do a poll. Raise your hand if you would pay for, if you would buy the CVS brand in that situation. In that situation. Wow. Wow. Raise your hand if you would buy the, if you would buy the Tylenol brand. 
<laughs> Why am I showing you guys this? I'm showing you this because you could say, like, how is this, what, if this, if this is an economist, like, dilemma, how does this happen? Say, so, well, maybe what's going on is, okay, well, this, this you find at the expensive store in the expensive neighborhood, this you find at the other store in the inexpensive neighborhood, and so on and so No, they're actually right next to each other on the shelf. Right, so it's not like people are hiding this from you. Right, it's not like people are hiding this from you. In fact, I took this picture three days ago in CVS, and I thought to myself, it's like, wow, yes, I am not stupid. I have a PhD, okay? And I know these two things are identical. I know these two things are identical. However, when I think about my own four-year-old, okay, thank you very much. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. So this is Zora Fabiana Reed, and she came into my life four years ago, and... <laughs> That's funny. Listen to me very carefully. When I'm in that situation, I, I told you guys, I know they're the same, but I think about this. I'm like, if you think for one second, it, I'm thinking about point zero 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 one pop probability that maybe that other thing that I'm not too sure of may hurt this child, forget it, <laughs> right, forget it. And then I, the other thing that I think about when I see this is I think to myself, wow, you know, what, ty what type of father am I? I gotta save a dollar on this. I gotta save a dollar. I gotta save a dollar. What type of father does that? And so, just the, que just the question I'm putting out there. Guys, listen to me, this is power of brand. This is the power of the brand, right? The reason, the price differential here can be thought of as a proxy for the utility that's associated with the things that have nothing to do with the attributes of the product. It's something else. And what my point is that if you can create this additional utility, this value that's associated with your brand, it gives you all kinds of extremely powerful benefits. I want to show you another example I love. This is an example from our own research that we did because I love these guys and Nike. Love this. Take a, take a black cotton t-shirt, run an experiment. And the experiment basically is you basically take uh, several hundred people, you randomly assign them to either this shirt or this shirt, right? Either or, right? So you randomly assign them to one of these two conditions, and then you let them try the shirt out, right? So they get to go use the shirt, they wear it, they go work out in it, they experience the product, they come back to you and then you ask them a bunch of questions. So you ask them things like, what do you think of the quality of this shirt? What's your willingness to pay for this shirt? How much would you want to spend? All of these different sorts of things. And what do you think time in and time in, time out, happen for the people who wear this version of the shirt. What do they report back to me? Higher and They'll swear to you this is a better quality product. <laughs> they will swear. Run a t-test on this, you'll find a statistically significant difference between the average perceived quality of this shirt versus this shirt, even though they're the same damn shirt. Right? What does that mean? That means that's brand. That's value of the brand. My point is that's psychological, right? Those associations that you guys talked about when I threw the swoosh sign up there, it's not by accident. Nike is not, do, Nike is not just out there running around, you know, trying to figure out you know, what's going to happen if, if we don't do. They're actually proactively involved in this, right? And so what Nike is doing, I, I challenge you to, to find a Nike commercial that says anything like, well, here, Here's my Nike shoe, and it's made of this kind of rubber, and these sorts of shoelaces, and the, here are the material properties, and here's how it holds up in a quality test, and blah, 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 blah. You'll never see that. What you will see is Nike talking about how the product makes you feel, right? What the product does for you in enabling you to transcend who you are through sport, right? That's a different value proposition, and that's, that's, that Nike wants to try to build that into the DNA of their brand, okay? And again, that's the power of brand. A brand is an asset. And if you don't believe it's true, here's another little experimental data point for you. So this was a study that was done not too long ago. Basically, they brought a bunch of people in, and they said, it was a three-part study, and one part, the first part of the study, they let people do a taste test, where they either let people drink 
what they thought was Gatorade or this branded product called Ice Mountain Water. Okay? Same stuff, same exact product. So they're thinking that they're drinking Gatorade or this other product. And then what happened is, okay, now that the taste test's over, we want you to participate in this little perform in this little product test. We've got this little exercise gripper. We want you to try it out for us. So here, you just take the exercise gripper and you just try it out, right? So the people then go into the other room and they're trying out the, ex the exercise gripper, right? The y-axis is the number of times that they did this on the exercise gripper, which is thought to be a measure of kind of performance. How, how strong are you willing to keep doing this? How motivated are you to keep doing this? What I'm showing you is that on the left-hand side, this thing called entity theory manipulation, that simply was a condition in which people were led to believe that they have a lot of control over their own identity and their own ability to aspire to be great and do great things. So what happens? So when you believe you can do great things and you, and you thought you were drinking Gatorade, you actually tried a little harder. Right? You actually tried a little harder, which is the, 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 the reason why the black bar on the left side is the biggest bar uh, in the analysis. So again, just brain, again, it's all in your head, right? It's psycho, perception is reality, it's all in your head. And this is another, what is Gatorade's mantra? Win from within, right? So again, trying to tell a story about aspirational selves, saying something that's trying to resonate with people's identity. Now, so I want to continue this sort of discussion. Here's another brand I want you to get your reactions to. What about this one? Be careful. What comes to mind? Be very careful. Mansions, what else? <laughs> sex, what else? Absolutely sex, what else? Mm -hmm. Hugh Hefner, smoking jacket maybe, what else? I'm waiting for somebody to tell me great articles. <laughs> um, it's interesting, so this is the Playboy brand, another phenomenal brand. I wanna show you a short clip of the value of brand and again, getting at this idea of why this has power. On the famous bunny trademark, Julia. Maria, Playboy may be known for its adult entertainment, but the real growth is in the power of its brand. The bunny icon is recognized all around the world. And Hugh Hefner's empire is just announcing that it's opening a freestanding Playboy concept boutique on London's Oxford Sp Street in the spring. This is the first store in Europe, which already provides 40% of Playboy's $750 million in annual retail revenue. London joins seven other bunny branded stores around the globe, several of which are in Asia, and there are plans to open three stores a year in the next couple of years. Playboy's licensing is its fastest growing segment. We know from experience that the stores are both financially beneficial because they're licensed with no capital on our part and the ability to collect royalties both from our licensees who sell the products into the store and from the store licensee at retail. But it also has a halo effect on the sale of our products in department stores and specialty stores throughout the market. While selling everything from bunny branded lingerie to designer jeans to a $5,000 diamond pendant and $50,000 watches, Playboy is also selling its brand in the entertainment space, this fall opening the Playboy Casino Club at the Palms in Las Vegas. The margin aspect of licensing is just absolutely flush. Uh, the folks that are taking the real inventory risk are the licensors of the product. So for the, just the Playboy concept boutique and club in Las Vegas alone, at the Palms, we're looking at $4 million in revenues at an 80% operating margin. Um, it's essentially free revenue. I mean, come on, is that, is, how about that for a business model, right? I mean, the idea that I can literally say, I can build up this brand. Right? I can spend a lot of time making sure this brand has the property that I want it to represent. Right? And I can go to Alana and I can say, Alana, you sell shirts. I'm going to allow you, I'm going to let you put my brand on your shirts and you're going to sell more shirts. And people are going to think your shirts are better. Right? And you're going to pay me a little bit of money to be able to do that. Come on. That's beautiful. Brilliant was the word that my man used over here in the orange shirt. Right? Think about that. That's incredible. Now, of course, there's risk, right? I mean, it's not, yes, they were saying that the licensor takes the inventory risk, but there's risk with the brand because if you obviously partner with the wrong individual or company, you know, you put your brand at risk. But if you think about that, that's an amazing business model to be able to, to leverage. And you're able to leverage that because of the brand, right? Because of the brand. And so this is, the, this is how I want you guys to start thinking. I want you guys to start thinking about the brand as an asset, 
right? Start thinking about the brand as an asset. And a lot of times what companies make the mistake of doing is they start thinking about the marketing piece afterwards, right? They make the product and they say, okay, let's now figure out what this is, you know, who we're gonna talk to. It should be the exact opposite. I'm gonna make the argument for this by showing you some of these examples. Here's another example going back to our friends at Coke, right? So I said I'm from Atlanta. This is a nice little study done in HBR in conjunction with Interbrand, basically looking at what is the, 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 what is the value of Coca-Cola with and without its brand relative to its market cap. And basically this analysis showed that the market cap without its brand, about 105 billion market cap with its brand, brand alone, listen to me guys, brand alone adds an additional 70 to 105 billion. Billion, that's what the B, billion, right? Think about that. And that's just, if, if you just take all of the, 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 the trucks and the, 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 the product and you strip that away, this other thing that's left is what consumes. And guys, you gotta think about this. Again, I'm not hating on Coke, I love Coke. I'm from Atlanta. But if you're honest with yourself, Coca-Cola is nothing more than malted battery acid, okay? <laughs> I kid you not, I kid you not. You know when you buy a new car and you have that new sticker on the car? And how irritating, you can't get the sticker off, just take some coke, pour it on there, and it'll come right off in three minutes, right? And it's interesting, you run a taste test, most people can't tell you the difference between coke and Pepsi when it's blind, right? Most people can't tell the difference, right? So this is brand, this is the power, this is the value of the brand.